great. We are going to turn it over to our final panel of the day. Um, and this uh, panel is uh, talking about uh, low carbon energy options in Wyoming. And Rob Mathis has graciously joined us as the moderator for this panel. Rob is another um, proud UW alumnus from the College of Law and undergraduate degrees as a Wyoming native himself. Um, Rob uh, currently has a is a managing counsel for Rockies for Occidental Petroleum and wanted to take a minute too to also thank Occidental Petroleum for a recent gift to the University of Wyoming for a couple of different positions in, in um, carbon management, one in the School of Engineering and one in the HELP School. So thank you so much Occidental for that gift. Um, but Rob, I'll turn it over to you for our last and certainly very uh, interesting panel on low carbon energy. Thanks so much, Temple. Really happy to join. Uh, I apologize for joining a few minutes earlier for those of you who saw me pop in and uh, really glad it was my friend Nada that I was jumping in on and not someone that I could be embarrassed further in front of. So I do apologize for that. Um, we have the last panel this afternoon, which is really exciting. Uh, I don't have to make the joke about, uh, I'm not gonna try to keep you from the cocktail hour at the end of this presentation soon. We're all working from home. So people have, I guess, flexibility, but we're really happy to be here. Um, really happy to support the University of Wyoming uh, from the Occidental standpoint uh, with the with the couple of chairs that Temple just mentioned, and our CEO had a chance to get over and see some of the facilities at the University of Wyoming last week and actually meet with the governor and some of the students there and just really appreciate our partnership with the university. Uh, my thanks to the rest of the panelists uh, that are going to be with us today as we look at kind of moving forward and we're going to look at low carbon energy in the Rocky Mountain West and we're going to look at it from a lot of different options. We're going to look at two things that the state of Wyoming has done as far as its future goals and some legislations that's passed and now it's into the implementation stage uh, with the, the state's um, net zero goal as well as House Bill 200 uh, that we're going to hear more about. Then we're also going to hear about things um, such as siting in the West and how we can move forward in, in the low carbon energy to have as few conflicts as possible, how the NEPA process plays into this whole situation. And uh, we're also going to hear from the regulated industry about how they're looking forward to uh, working in a low carbon energy future. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order that they're actually going to present in, which is going to be a little bit different than appeared in your program. Uh, first, we're going to have Glenn Morrell, the executive director from the Wyoming Energy Authority. He's originally from New Zealand, but has over two decades of experience in the oil and gas industry, previously worked for the University of Wyoming in the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute. Next, we'll have Nels Johnson from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, he's based in Bozeman, Montana, and is the North American Energy Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. He works with the TNC teams across North America to integrate smart siting and energy development. Next up, we'll have uh, my good friend, Mary Throne for, uh, with the Wyoming Public Service Commissioner. Mary has practiced law for a number of years in Wyoming, and she also served in the Wyoming House for 10 years, having also been its minority leader for four of those years. Mary is going to speak about House Bill 200 and its implementation. Next up, we're going to have James Owen, who's the Vice President of Environmental Fuels and Mining for Pacific Corp. Uh, his responsibilities encompass strategic planning, planning, stakeholder engagement, and oversight fueling strategy, mining operations, environmental compliance, and major generation resource additions for Pacific Corp. Can't wait to hear him. Finally, we're going to have Sharon Bettino from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, Sharon has previously served as the Director of Lands at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Her current work focuses on on public land management, energy policy, and government transparency. And with that, we're going to start over, Start with Glenn, who's going to talk about Wyoming's uh, recent goals. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob. I, um, I actually already have my cocktail right here. Uh, I'm still at work, but um, I'm the boss here, so I'm, I can get away with that. The, uh, my chat this afternoon, I'm going to take um, a little bit of time to do a, somewhat of an introductory speech here to let you all know uh, what the Energy Authority is, who I represent, what we do. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the Wyoming Energy Strategy, um, spend some time trying to make it very clear why, uh, why a net zero or low emissions future is so important for Wyoming uh, on an economics level. And once we establish that, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the key initiatives that we're pursuing and, um, and wrap it up with a bit of, um, you know, a plan, essentially how we plan to actually get there. And it's a, it's a heck of a challenge. So we have to spend some time um, dwelling on that. <clears throat> so the 
Wyoming Energy Authority came into existence on the 1st of July, 2020. So right in the middle of COVID, uh, it was established then. It's when I started here at the authority itself as well. And it, was, it came about through the merger of two pre-existing authorities, the Pipeline Authority and the Infrastructure Authority, and at least in terms of resources. So the budget and the headcount that I took on came from the merger of those two. The, the scope, however, is, is far, far greater than that. It's the, it's the entire uh, economic sector. So the energy economic sector, uh, coal, oil, gas, thermal, renewables, uranium, uh, new aspects like carbon management, hydrogen, um, rare earth elements, on and on and on. And it's the entire value chain. So upstream, midstream and downstream. Uh, in addition to that, we also take care of all the non-energy extractors as well. So the Trona industry also falls within the purview of the, the energy authority. Uh, we're also a very small um, organization. There are only four people here. And so um, we have a heck of a task when the Wyoming energy economy is happens to be the third largest in the country, right? So um, one of the big uh, impetus behind establishing the authority was to create a, a coordinating hub for all the energy activities that are going on in the state, particularly at the state level. The, there is no um, central organization for energy within the state. There's a whole bunch of them. There's the Geological Survey, the School of Energy Resources, the PSC, uh, the Business Council does certain energy activities, and, and there's multiple dispersive sort of efforts going on. Um, in contrast to the, the presence of a Department of Agriculture, there is no Department of Energy for Wyoming. So we were established to, to provide that sort of key little hub around all these efforts, and we were um, a lot of it was simply to, to give all those other agencies some direction and ensure that everybody is pulling on the same rope at the same time. Okay, so how do we do that? Four person shop, how do we affect all of those people? Well, we, it's one of our um, primary responsibilities is the establishment of the Wyoming energy strategy. So, and that's how we do it. So that is literally written into our statute that that's our responsibility. So we, we work on that and we hope to have a, a, a strategy that is adaptable and it's evergreen and it's inclusive and that helps all our partners, not just in the public sector, but also even in the private sector, understand what the great ambition of Wyoming is with respect to its energy economy and they understand the framework in which they can pursue their own opportunities. <clears throat> so that took a lot of time to put that together. It was an important piece of work and we focused on that right from the start. And uh, we first felt set out to define the problem. And what we did was simply look at a lot of our markets and the trends that are going on in there. And when you look at it, it doesn't matter whether it's natural gas into California or which is our number one market or coal into Texas, which is our number two geo commodity market uh, in well, the top five or the top 10 markets, it doesn't matter. Every single one of them, the, there is a, there's a, a, major, um, a predominance and an increasing in interest by consumers, whether it's individuals or corporate level, for the demand to be for low emissions energy. So that's, that's it, okay, that's the problem statement or opportunity statement is that people want low emissions energy. So that's the problem statement or opportunity statement that informs the strategy. So the strategy uh, to cut to the chase, the, the, the unifying objective, the prime, prime objective, the flag on the hill, the North Star, however you want to define it, is pretty simple. Wyoming wants to continue to power the nation, which is something we've proudly done for decades. Um, it, it contributed to the well-being and standard of living of literally hundreds of millions of Americans through export of cheap and re reliable and resilient energy for 40 or 50 years. We're going to continue to do that. We're gonna do it with an all of the above energy mix, which means we're not going to pick winners. We're not gonna create silos. We're not gonna try and boost one sector, subsector against the other. It's all of the above. We, we will embrace all of our natural resources, both hydrocarbon and renewable and other. And the key piece though, is a net zero ambition. So that is the critical piece that brings it all together. And um, as like I mentioned, the consumer markets that we serve and we deliver all this energy into those markets, they have this increasing demand for low emissions energy. So it's essential, it's absolutely essential that Wyoming has a net zero ambition because if we don't, we'll simply be shut out of that market eventually, right? That's the trend that we've seen for a decade or more already in certain ways, uh, decreasing demand for various hydrocarbon fuels. That's not gonna stop unless we find a way to take that hydrocarbon rich resource and deliver it in a form that is desirable. And desirable in this case means with a low emissions profile. So net zero ambition means we continue to, ser to serve the markets that we've served for a very long time. <clears throat> so that's why net zero is so important. 
Um, now, of course, that's enormous and massive challenge for, for a state like Wyoming, where our emissions profile is absolutely dominated by energy production, or actually, be careful, energy consumption. Um, that is a big challenge because all our energy is mostly, mostly hydrocarbon based. There's a lot of renewables and other ways as well, but uh, the big three are coal, oil, and gas. So we have to find ways to continue to, to utilize those resources and, and deliver that energy in a desirable fashion. So that brings us to the, in, the initiatives that we're pursuing. Uh, I would, could spend some time talking about strategic opportunities, but I'll skip that piece and just go into, straight into the initiatives. So carbon capture utilization of storage is perhaps the biggest opportunity we have. Uh, that's not to discount the efforts we have ongoing with respect to conservation and efficiency. Uh, we actually house a lot of that here, the state energy program, very useful, very vital piece of the, of the puzzle. Um, but CCUS is really the big, uh, the big hammer, the big lever that we can deploy in, that enables us to secure and sustain our energy, energy economy. So we have to find a way to commercialize and deploy carbon catch utilization storage technology today. It is, it is vitally urgent that we fix that. So that's one of the big initiatives we're pursuing is the establishment of sequestration hubs in the, in the uh, state. We have a lot of reservoir capacity for sequestration. Uh, we have this ambition to create sequestration hubs uh, so that all the emitters can then benefit because they can essentially pay somebody to take the CO2 or secure it without having to deal with their own capex and design issues on the sequestration piece. That's one big approach. Um, CCUS is a very interesting technology for enabling other low emission solutions, such as bioenergy with uh, CCS and also hydrogen. And hydrogen is a fascinating prospect for Wyoming as well. We have about 25% of the nation's feedstock, the nation's feedstock for hydrogen production and generation is in Wyoming. That's both materials such as coal and natural gas, but also energy forms like renewable energy. Combined, we have about 25% of the country's natural feedstock is in Wyoming, which is astounding, right? So there's a massive potential for Wyoming to continue to have that primary role as an energy headwater, essentially, and distributing low carbon, potentially net zero, car um, sorry, net zero energy to major markets, for example, in the West Coast, um, perhaps just south of here into the Denver metropole, uh, perhaps east to the Midwest. Uh, those markets are all accessible from Wyoming, uh, and there's a the massive potential there for us to, to, to seize. The, the third major initiative is, is far more recent than those. It's uh, advanced nuclear. So advanced nuclear was always part of our strategy when we, when we first started developing it early, late last year. But the announcement by Terra Power and Pacific Core, <clears throat> which is incredibly exciting, just, just boosted the urgency and the, and the importance of that initiative. So uh, to be honest, we're doing a lot of catch up because there's not a lot of expertise in Wyoming with respect to advanced nuclear industries. But uh, what we are learning is that it's not just about a reactor. It's not just about electricity. So what I mean by that is there are so many more opportunities from the establishment of advanced nuclear industry in the state that we're trying to understand and get our hands around. For example, um, one is simply that the other value chains, fuel cycle value chain is a very interesting uh, opportunity for Wyoming. We mine uranium and have done for a very long time. But once you have mined the uranium, there's storage, there's enrichment, there's milling, there's fuel production as well. There's a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of manufacturing opportunity as well around this advanced, uh, advanced nuclear industries with respect to um, just the heavy industry, tubulars, pressure vessels, kind of opportunity that we're pretty good at because of our history in coal and oil and gas. There's interesting potential there. Perhaps though what the most interesting piece is, is how an advanced nuclear industry plugs into uh, or integrates with an established low emissions energy economy. One great thing about advanced nuclear is it comes with a lot of high value, high grade heat and power. And when you have a decarbonized um, ancillary infrastructure like hydrogen and then a carbon management system, there's tons of potential there for development of um, zero carbon uh, fuels and hydrocarbon based products. So you can start to think about synthetic natural gas, for example or net zero plastics. And that is all enabled by those by that um, advanced nuclear plugging in there. Uh, final thoughts, and we have about a minute to go here. <clears throat> the, the three big initiatives, sequestration, hydrogen, and advanced nuclear are all enabled by this massive transition or transformation, I prefer to use the word transformation, energy transformation that the planet is going through right now. 
in the absence of that, none of these things would really be viable, They'd not really make sense. And so when we talk about energy transition in Wyoming, it's, it typically comes, it, it promotes a little bit of anxiety amongst people and a little bit of angst. Uh, my point, and one thing I try to stress as much as I possibly can, is that these are all opportunities that are enabled by the change that we're going through now. Okay, so change equals opportunity, not a threat. Now, that's not to say there's going to be some tough times. We're living through some tough times right now, but there are certainly green shoots in the future in terms of how these opportunities will be uh, built out in the state, and the potential is absolutely there for Wyoming to, to really thrive in a, in a low emissions, net zero uh, future economy. Thanks, Rob. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that, Glenn. Now we're going to turn it over to Nels with the Nature Conservancy to talk about some siting issues. <clears throat> hey, thanks, Rob. Um, can people hear me? For some reason, I'm not able to start my video. Start my video. Okay. Hi, uh, Rob. Can you can you hear me? Can the audience hear me? Just want to make sure that I, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. Sorry, I had a glitch with my Zoom earlier today. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's hard to be definitive in twelve minutes on the panel today. So I'm going to try and uh, just do a brief kind of introduction to low impact solutions for a low carbon energy future in the Rocky Mountain states. And I wanna leave you kind of with three uh, points. First of all, however we build out a low carbon future, <clears throat> the scope and scale of this transformation as Glenn put it, is enormous. It will touch down in every community, every landscape in North America. Not surprisingly, the potential for conflict therefore is significant. So we have a, a real imperative to try and find ways that we can accommodate all that infrastructure in ways that don't create impacts to the environment, to our communities, that create conflict and, and slow that transformation down. Brownfields and Mylands, or the second point I wanna make, provide an important opportunity for low impact solutions uh, for this huge low impact, uh, low carbon energy future that we are starting to build out. And I wanna leave you with a few ideas about both state and federal policy opportunities that we can be looking at in order to advance these low impact solutions. Next slide. So just to get a sense of that, scale of the build out. Here are the challenges that we're facing. First of all, we're only 10 or 15 percent into the build out. So most of what is coming hasn't been built yet. We have an enormous amount of infrastructure coming. Those new low carbon energy technologies, wind and solar are prominent examples, but there are others too, are less energy dense than fossil fuels. And as a result, they need more land, they need more area. Um, that potent, presents the potential for social and environmental conflicts that could, in the end, bog down this transformation. And when we look at where we want to try and be with net zero, we want to try and be there by 2050, three short decades from now. Next. So just to get another graphic kind of illustration of how big this challenge is, this is from the Princeton Net Zero America study that came out several months ago. But when they looked at the land use requirements for all the energy infrastructure for various scenarios for getting to net zero, they identified an area roughly the size of Colorado and Wyoming combined where all that stuff has to go. So you can imagine the potential for conflict if we don't think about where all this stuff goes. Next. The Nature Conservancy is now conducting its own assessment of how we get to a low carbon future for the Western United States. We're looking at all 11 Western states. So while Glenn talked about uh, Wyoming, some of the images and, and data I'm gonna be showing you uh, comes from the Western US. That's all Western 11 Western states that are part of what's called the Western Interconnect, including Wyoming. Next. Uh, 
Uh, and the reason we're doing this study is to try and figure out how do those scenarios work in terms of trying to avoid impacts. Um, and next slide, we look at a variety of different scenarios for getting to net zero by 2050. The only thing that's common amongst these different scenarios is that they all require a significant amount of new energy expansion beyond what we're building today. So anywhere from two times to four, five, and six times the rate of clean energy technologies that are being built today need to be built in the future between now and 2050. So the lower increases are if we have uh, pathways that rely more on uh, nuclear, as Glenn was saying, or on um, <clears throat> uh, gas with carbon capture. But if we go all the way to mostly a reliance on clean energy, uh, renewable energy technologies, the, the land area requirement is much larger and the build out requirement is much larger. Next. So the EPA has identified about 43 million acres across the United States of brownfields and mindlands that at least technically are feasible for clean energy development. That's an area about the size of Florida. So it's not as big as the entire area that we need, but it could be an important opportunity for deploying clean energy technologies. And there's some other reasons why we think these lands uh, represent some really value added, really important new places to think about clean energy development. Next. So one reason why we think uh, these lands can be good is they already come with some assets in place that can help to facilitate clean energy deployment. In many of these places, we have workers and equipment that can be adapted or redeployed uh, uh, for new uh, clean energy technologies. We often have transmission and utility infrastructure nearby because many of these sites required lots of energy in the first place. Uh, we have access, we have roads, um, we often have flat and cleared land, and um, we also uh, can integrate the clean energy in with other land uses that might take place on these sites. Next. But if these places are so great, why aren't we seeing a lot? There are only a handful of projects of clean energy on former mine lands and brownfields across the United States. Most of them are landfills. There are a whole bunch of reasons why these lands aren't yet being the focus of much clean energy development. Some of it is financing and lack of incentives. Some of it is a perception of liability, legal liability in terms of reclamation. Um, some of it is around permitting because there are extra permitting requirements that may be required to to develop energy on these sites. Point is, there are a variety of barriers that we need to address through policies, through incentives to make these opportunities uh, more um, attractive for developers across the West, including in Wyoming. Next. So the current model of mining has is, is really been focused on getting the resource, the particular mining resource out with a real focus on getting that one resource out and then reclaiming the property um, and moving on. What we're suggesting and what we think is the opportunity, next slide, is to think of these sites as opportunities for a new life in the future in the energy world and that these can become energy hubs for the future. These can be places not only where we deploy uh, renewable energy, but we can be doing carbon capture and storage. We can be doing direct air capture. We can be doing uh, electrolysis and development of hydrogen, as Glenn was talking about. We can store energy at these sites. So these sites can take on a new life again and again be central to the new energy economy of the future. Next. In order to do that, as I mentioned, we are going to have to improve policies. We are going to have to create incentives to facilitate that kind of development. I'm not going to go into all the details. Of course, 
state policy is really important in the way energy is developed and regulated in the United States. We've taken a look at those opportunities. A lot of that's around federal laws and how they're delegated in the United States to states, and they have a responsibility for coming up with regulations for implementing. So there are opportunities there. There are other things that states can do. If you're interested in learning more, we have an overview of those opportunities at this link. And I'd encourage any of you who are interested in this topic to take a look. And then I'll just close with some thoughts about federal changes that are going on in the last slide. Next. There has been some really encouraging development recently at the federal level that we think can really help to advance energy development on mine lands and, and brownfields, including in Wyoming. So first of all, Energy Act of 2020, um, which passed in December, directs the Department of Energy to research solutions to address technical barriers to clean energy on mine lands and brownfields. There are gonna be a number of workshops that invite uh, experts from the mining industry, from energy uh, companies, and from research institutions to examine and propose uh, solutions to some of these barriers. There'll be four regional workshops. One of them will be in the Rocky Mountain states. Um, the locations and dates haven't been uh, finalized, but probably in January and February, those uh, workshops are likely to happen. Um, in the Investment and Jobs Act, that's otherwise known as a bipartisan infrastructure bill that's pending in Congress right now, there's a provision there to authorize five clean energy technology demonstration projects on mine lands, authorized at $500 million. So if that does pass, um, there could be a significant federal investment in demonstration projects at scale to um, work on this issue. And then in the reconciliation bill, of course, it's hard to speculate what's going to happen with that. But if it does pass as currently drafted, there is a provision in the bill currently that would provide a 10% additional federal tax credit for clean energy technologies that are deployed on mine lands and brownfields. So there's hope at the federal level, the opportunities at the state level, and uh, look forward to the discussion later. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nels. We appreciate your contribution and look forward to talking more. Next up, we're going to have uh, Mary Throne, who's another proud Campbell County native like myself, and she's going to talk about House Bill 200 and some of the things that are ongoing as a result of that bill's passage and PSC's attempts to impl implement that rule. Uh, thank you, Rob, and thanks for the kind introduction. And I'm even in Campbell County. I borrowed a conference room. Uh, if we could just go to the first slide with text, that would be great, which I can't see. Uh, while they work to get my slide up, I'll just take this um, moment to do the, the standard government representative uh, disclaimer uh, that I'm only here uh, speaking for myself and not my fellow commissioners or uh, any official state position. And there are my slides. Thank you. Uh, so uh, someone's got to have the slides with uh, a lot of text and I guess that would be me. So if we could go to the first, the next slide, please. Uh, before you can um, understand House Bill 200, I just wanted to set out very briefly the uh, framework uh, under which every public service commission in the country operates. Uh, the basics of PSC authority are referred to as the regulatory compact. Uh, the regulator grants a company a protected monopoly for the sale and distribution of services uh, to customers in its service territory. And the theory behind this is that you wouldn't want everybody building power lines and distribution lines. It's sort of economies of scale. It's a natural monopoly. Uh, in return, the company assumes responsibility to supply full quantities required by the customer. And this is important when we get to discussing House Bill 200 at a price calculated to cover all their operating costs, plus an opportunity, not a guarantee, 
to earn a reasonable return on the capital that they've invested. And um, the Wyoming Public Service Commission has broad general and exclusive power uh, to regulate all the public utilities in the state. Next slide. So House Bill 200, uh, Reliable and Dispatchable Low Carbon Energy Standard was uh, created, uh, created uh, to a new Article 18 rather uh, in Title 37, uh, just two sections, 101 and 102. It became effective July 1st, 2020. Uh, and I think it's important to know that this is part of a series of bills the legislature has passed related to coal-fired generation. Um, SF-159 passed in 2019, uh, which requires uh, a utility to uh, make a good faith effort to find a purchaser for a retiring coal unit. Uh, SF-21 um, sort of tweaked SF-159. SF-136 and House Bill 166 uh, are new bills uh, just recently passed. Uh, we haven't yet done the rulemaking for those bills, so stay tuned. Uh, next slide. So here's the, uh, the definitions in House Bill 200, which um, you know, fit in nicely with the theme of this panel. Uh, first, we, it defines uh, terms just unique to Article 18. So carbon capture utilization and storage technology uh, is technology to use or capture carbon dioxide. And this is an important phrase, whether constructed inter integral or adjacent to a coal-fired generation facility. And the theory behind that uh, last little phrase is that it could be, uh, somebody else could be uh, construct the carbon capture facility, perhaps to use it for EOR. Uh, so there was the addition of adjacent. Uh, dispatchable means available for use on demand. Uh, low carbon is defined as electricity using CCUS. And finally, reliable is generated electricity that is not subject to intermittent availability as renewables at this stage of the game are. Next slide. So what does a utility have to do under uh, House Bill 200? Uh, the, the overriding obligation is for the utility to generate a specified percentage of dispatchable and reliable low carbon electricity. So carbon, so CCUS, um, on a coal plant uh, as approved by the Public Service Commission. And they have uh, until July 1st of 2030 to achieve this goal. The second bullet item is interesting. And my recollection is it was added uh, by the industrial energy consumers. It was part of their amendment. Uh, the, and it really is something that is almost standalone. Uh, it could be in a separate bill on its own, in my opinion, uh, but it's to establish baseline standards for electric reliability for every utility to ensure that the expansion of intermittent resources, uh, renewables, do not uh, unreasonably diminish the quality of the power. Uh, and finally, um, this is sort of the hammer provision of House Bill 200, Non-compliance uh, with the bill results in a bar to cost recovery, thinking back to the regulatory compact, uh, results in a bar to cost recovery for replacement facilities uh, that are used to replace coal-fired generation retired um, after January 1st. So you have to comply with House Bill 200 and then the reference to 37.3.117 um, is Senate file 159. So that's, that's part of the um, sort of the incentive and the burden of these bills. Next slide. So uh, key provisions of House Bill 200 relate to um, innovative cost recovery. And I'm not sure I'm 
doing well with my time here, but I will speed up. Uh, the utility may apply to the Public Service Commission uh, for a higher return on equity to meet this low carbon standard. Uh, again, thinking back to that very first slide I showed you, the right to earn a reasonable return. Generally, in a rate making proceeding, it's just one return on equity. But for carbon capture, we're saying they could seek a higher return on the equity. Um, typically, income, the second bullet point uh, earned by a utility uh, goes to benefit the ratepayers. Uh, but this would allow revenue sharing with the shareholders for a portion of the revenue. Uh, it also allows a utility to apply uh, for a surcharge of 2% on each customer's electric bill. And the key provision here, in addition to the 2%, is collected in advance. Typically, cost recovery is done after something is built. It's not done before. So that is an innovation. And then there's a catch-all at the end uh, that if the rate recovery mechanism is insufficient to compensate the utility, that the PSC will take additional steps. Next slide. So as you can imagine, uh, this bill requires rulemaking. Uh, we noticed the rules, proposed rules on August 30th. Uh, there was extensive stakeholder engagement um, on these draft rules uh, before we went to the formal rulemaking. Uh, there's a public hearing on October 28th. Public comments are due by the 22nd. Uh, the draft rule includes uh, draft definitions as they relate to uh, the specific provisions, baseline standards for electric reliability, um, electric reliability, incremental cost, um, and you can, you can see the list. Let's pop on to the next slide. So the way we envision this working, of course, is each utility is gonna have to meet its own uh, low carbon standard. So we have, uh, as the rules as proposed, require an application by March 31st, uh, 2022, um, to contain all of these things to basically make an initial proposal, uh, but the final plan due date is March 31st, 2023. Uh, and then until the time uh, the utility achieves compliance, annual reports are due in March of each year. It's a pretty short time frame, but it's, uh, again, a lot of work has uh, gone into this. And also there's a long period before uh, 2030. And the idea is that it, it will take time to achieve these goals. I sort of whipped through that, but I look forward to everybody's questions. Thanks so much, Mary, really appreciate that. And now we're going to hear back from James Owen from Pacificorp. Thank you, Rob. Can is my video up? Okay. You're good, James. Thank you. Uh, so we can advance to the next slide, please. So I want to start off uh, the discussion today from the utility perspective, just by giving a snapshot of, of Pacific Core, so um, everyone has a sense of of which utility and and the scope of of our uh, service area. So Pacific Core is a subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway Energy. And we're broken up into two uh, operating companies, uh, Pacific Power and Rocky Mountain Power. Um, I want to note that we are um, accountable to six different public service commissions. So we uh, just got the privilege to hear from Commissioner Throne in Wyoming. Um, and, and we can see that as uh, states and commissions develop rules and, and, and requirements for public uh, utilities like Pacific Core, uh, uh, we're beholden to those rules and responsibilities. So um, uh, we have all six of, uh, of the states listed on the screen that we um, are accountable to for, for all of our processes being a regulated utility. Uh, we cover about 2 million uh, customers throughout our service territory. 
And rather than talking on this slide about you know, necessarily the statistics, I wanna just kind of point out the, the, the fact that uh, we have a fairly diverse ideology across our service territory, uh, particularly as it relates to energy policy. And so as we have energy policy developed on the West Coast, uh, we find that differs uh, from the energy policy that develops in our Rocky Mountain states. Uh, which can create some uh, complications for us. And as we try to develop uh, plans that um, meet the expectation, expectations and requirements of those systems, uh, that's a significant piece for us is to understand those, those diversities. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about low carbon energy uh, from a utility perspective, the size of Pacific Core, it's a very broad question. Um, obviously, and there's been a few of these different technologies that have been discussed at length today, but we could talk about renewables, we could talk about storage, hydrogen and nuclear obviously are big, big items right now, and, and we've had some sub substantive discussion on that as well. Uh, but, but I wrote down wh what Glenn discussed as the, the big hammer, right? So coal with carbon capture installed. And so um, rather than, you know, try to delve into all of these other pieces of low carbon energy, I'm going to focus uh, the discussion today on coal with carbon capture and specifically uh, what, what Pacific Ore is doing right now, how we're evaluating it, and what we're doing as it relates to the rulemaking processes that are unfolding as discussed by Commissioner Throne. Next slide, please. So to understand how we go about um, evaluating implementation of any resource into our system, uh, it's useful to understand uh, the planning tool that we use. Uh, the planning tool is, is something that is required for us in order to, to demonstrate prudence as we're making decisions, as we make capital investments, um, as we make decisions that impact customer costs. Uh, as Commissioner Throne mentioned, uh, you know, we're a permissible monopoly uh, as a regulated utility. So in order for us to recover on uh, capital expenditures, we go to our commissions and we go through rate case processes. And we explain, these are the costs that we've incurred um, and this is why those costs were prudent, and this is why it's justified for us to include those uh, in rates. And so the, the planning tool that our company uses is called an integrated resource plan or an IRP. Uh, and essentially what this does is, is, is this allows us to model the economic and operational performance of, of a variety of, of resource additions, subtractions, what have you. And the focus of the IRP is to achieve low cost, low risk. And, and that is really for the benefit of our customers. We wanna be able to keep our customer prices uh, affordable. We wanna make sure that our system is reliable and we want to eliminate risk as much as we possibly can. Uh, so our IRP is updated every two years and the most recent version of the IRP uh, was published in September of this year. Um, and, and this document is, is fairly expansive and it's available uh, on our website and, and anybody uh, is encouraged to go and review our IRP. Uh, this is essentially explains our decision-making process. Uh, next slide. So the 2021 IRP that just published was a very exciting one because it is the first IRP that we have modeled and evaluated carbon capture uh, to this degree. So we evaluated ca carbon capture on eight of our 11 coal units in Wyoming. Uh, the reason that we didn't do all 11 of them is simply because we had a couple of units that were essentially identical. And so the technical and economic analysis for those units were essentially surrogates for each other. So there was no need to, to evaluate those. They, they were essentially equil equivalent. So I can say, in effect, we know how carbon capture modeled for all 11 of our coal units in Wyoming. I also want to flag that we have looked at um, a wide variety of, of carbon capture technology. CCUS is not just one technology out there. There are a number of them. And I, I've listed a few on the screen very briefly so that folks could see that uh, there are, there are um, a lot of different uh, varieties that could be evaluated. And each of these technologies comes with a different costs and different assumptions. Uh, the one that we picked or used, I, I wouldn't say picked because it, it has kind of picked itself um, for our uh, baseline assumption for modeling is a mean-based post-combustion. Uh, and there's a simple reason for that, and, and it's because it's the only uh, technology that's uh, to date that's been demonstrated at a commercial scale on a coal plant. So while some of these other technologies have been demonstrated on different uh, sites of just different types of industrial sites, uh, when we're focused on a, a coal generating facility with a car facility with a carbon capture retrofit, a mean base post combustion is the one um, that car carries the lowest risk of all of them. Uh, just, I, I put a schematic up on the screen, uh, rather than go into all of the details, just a very high level. 
uh, you'll notice there's, there's a flue gas intake into the system on the bottom left hand side of the diagram. Uh, the flue gas comes off the power plant and it goes into an absorber which is, which is filled with an amine solvent. Uh, amine is a, an ammonia based uh, product that you take one of the hydrogen atoms out of, out of the ammonia and replace it with an organic compound. Uh, that interacts to scrub the CO2. Uh, that CO2 rich, rich solvent is sent over to a desorber where the CO2 is separated back uh, from the amine, uh, the, the captured carbon is sent out and either sequestered permanently or used, you know, utilized for enhanced oil recovery, for example. Uh, and then the lean solvent uh, of the amine is uh, taken back over to the absorber again and the system starts over, it's regenerative. Uh, so high level, obviously this is a very complicated technology. Uh, it, it's an expensive technology, uh, but high level, that's the technology that is the baseline assumption in the IRP. Uh, I will note that as information uh, is um, gathered and gained on other technologies, uh, we're certainly open to and, and, and we will model um, other technologies as, as they start to mature and become uh, less risky. Next slide. So the cost assumptions that we built uh, as we model this, I, I mentioned that the IRP is operational uh, and economic. Uh, so the cost assumptions because we don't have one of these on our system yet, uh, what we did is we went to find as much information as we could about what it would cost to actually implement this. Uh, we have feasibility studies that have been completed on our facilities. We're in contact with numerous uh, carbon capture developer, developers and technology companies, which have they've been great to work with providing information. Uh, there are a couple of existing carbon capture facilities, uh, Petronova down in Texas uh, and, and Sask Power, uh, Boundary Dam facility up in Canada. Uh, are the only two in North America that are currently operating. And so we have leveraged to our to the best of our ability, uh, lessons learned and, and information from those facilities. Uh, we've also you know, engaged with academia. Um, we're reviewing academic studies and also information that's available uh, through DOE. And, and we take this information and we compare it to our assumptions. Um, and that gives us a, a sense of reasonableness as we model um, how it will perform. Um, and again, these are all changing um, dynamics. Uh, uh, feasibility studies are ongoing for multiple carbon capture um, processes throughout the country. And we understand that, uh, you know, DOE's processes are constantly changing. There are constantly new academic studies. As that new information is made available to us, we take those and we um, can look at those and evaluate whether or not our initial assumptions are reasonable and, and what should be changed. Um, I'll also note that uh, we have to account for, you know, things like additional emission control requirements. Um, as you operate coal plants, it comes with a lot of environmental regulation. It comes with a lot of compliance obligation. And so um, we're looking at that very closely. We also um, look very closely at the cost offsets, not just the cost, but how you pay for it, right? And the primary uh, ones are 45Q tax credits. Um, and then enhanced oil recovery, uh, you, you, you can sell it, right, to oil and gas companies that would use it in their processes. Next slide. So um, we modeled in our 2021 IRP, and it wasn't selected uh, as, as a base assumption, but we wanted to test that outcome. So one of the things that we did is we hardwired carbon capture into the system to see what it would take in order for the model to pick it. And what we discovered is that we would have to have um, a significant decrease in cost or an even more significant increase in revenues, uh, which is a simple concept, right? So that the model is just telling us if the capital costs go down or if the um, amount of money you're able to get from it goes up, then you could eventually get to break even economics. And of course, an increase in the tax credit would be very impactful for that. Uh, next slide. I won't belabor uh, this point too much. I, I appreciate Commissioner Throne stepping through the uh, requirements and details of House Bill 200. I will, however, note that this is something that we are very keenly aware of and, and working toward meeting. And in particular, low carbon under this rule limits to uh, carbon capture, right? So as we're evaluating low carbon, um, we can't really talk about wind. We can't really talk about renewables. We can't even talk about natural gas because this particular standard is focused on carbon capture on coal. So again, as we evaluate this and try to meet that July 31st, 2030 deadline for meeting the requirements, and as we build in you know, the intermediate obligations, uh, we are gonna be continually analyzing, okay, what is that low cost, low risk answer um, as we go about meeting that formal rulemaking step. Next slide. So, uh, and next and final slide actually. So what are we doing and where are we going? Uh, well, we're gonna continue to evaluate this. Obviously we have to. 
Uh, so we're building from a previous request for expression of interest that we issued for one of our facilities back in 2018. Um, in 2021, we issued a new request for expression of interest, but that's for all of our facilities. Essentially, we went out to the market. We went out to the market and said, okay, we want to know what technologies you have, what capabilities you have, and how you can go about helping us achieve our goal. And so that was issued in June of this year, and we've got uh, a good response so far. We're having some great responses. Uh, what we're going to do with those responses is build our own RFP or request for proposal that I plan to issue sometime in 2022. And that, that RFP will be informed by those REOI responses. Um, and again, the, REO, the RFP's focus will be, okay, explain to us the technology, explain to us the, um, the process, and, and here are a set of rules, regulations across our six, six service areas um, that we have to meet. And then, of course, we're going to continue to evaluate things. We're going to model sensitivities in our IRP. Uh, even though we run that and publish it every two years, it's an iterative process even in between. And we're also evaluating pilot projects for you know, various types of technologies that are still emerging. We're looking at those as well. Uh, and I look forward to further discussions and questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, really appreciate that. Uh, our final speaker in this panel is going to be Sharon Buccino. Sharon and I have known each other for a long time, litigated a couple of cases together, but also collaborated on a lot of things through Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation and others. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Sharon. Great. Well, thank you. So last panelist, um, you've already heard a lot of very useful, great information on this panel. Um, I'm going to add a little bit more and I'll do my best to um, make it interesting and, and worth your while. So the infrastructure bill and reconciliation have come up several times today. I'm going to drill down on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. All of the issues that we've been discussing today require infrastructure. So how can we encourage such infrastructure to happen faster? The bipartisan infrastructure bill that Congress has been debating includes several provisions designed to do so. So next slide, please. I'll describe these provisions and offer a few ideas about how to implement them. An infrastructure bill has been a priority of the Biden administration as well as leaders in Congress since inauguration last January. The Senate's passage of a bipartisan bill in August dramatically increases the odds that an infrastructure package uh, will become law. Now, much of the discussion about the infrastructure bill has been about dollars. So how much, who gets the money, and where will the money come from? The provisions in the bill that affect how the money will be spent may matter even more. So next slide. The uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, it's HR 3634, provides over a trillion dollars in new federal spending. Uh, it includes money for roads and bridges, passenger and rail, freight, broadband, water infrastructure, power and grid, and carbon capture, carbon storage as well. Next slide, please. But buried in this bill are several key provisions that affect permitting for infrastructure projects. To understand the permitting provisions that are in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we have to go back several years, back to 2015, when Congress passed and the president signed the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, or the FAST Act. Well, in name about transportation projects, Title 41 of the FAST Act contained provisions affecting environmental review for all kinds of projects, including pipelines and transmission lines. So what does FAST 41 do? Well, it uh, defines covered projects. These are larger projects likely to cost more than $200 million. It also establishes a federal permitting improvement steering council. It sets timetables for review, limits on judicial review, and establishes a permitting dashboard. Next slide. So this image, for those of us in Laramie, 
we've seen all too often, especially around the university. But Title 41 of the FAST Act is aimed at something else. It is designed to move projects along. By creating an interagency council to coordinate the various agencies involved and approvals required for infrastructure projects, the legislation aims to accelerate project permitting. Next slide. That brings us to HR 3684, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I'll highlight in particular section 7801. What's most important about this provision is that it makes the provisions of Title 41 of the FAST Act permanent. So when the um, FAST Act was originally passed in 2015, the provisions of Title 41 had limited duration. They would sunset at the end of 2022. The idea was to see if they actually improved permitting efficiency and effectiveness. There's little actual analysis of the provisions, uh, but there are, I mean, there are plenty of people that do think they've worked well. And, and what happened as the negotiations for the bipartisan infrastructure bill were going on is there were Republicans and some Democrats, but the Republicans insisted on making these permitting provisions permanent as part of the infrastructure bill. And that's what uh, passed in the, uh, in the version that came out of the Senate. And so it makes the permitting council and the dashboard permanent. It makes timetable requirements and limits on judicial review permanent. It, it limits consideration of alternatives. And it also gives the Office of Management and Budget the authority to resolve disputes. Uh, it's also important to point out that even though there is a definition of covered projects, the director of this permitting council has the ability to add projects um, that are um, uh, recommended, the discretion exists with the director, uh, even if they don't meet that cost threshold uh, in the definition of covered projects. So next and last slide. Oh, I have, I'm sorry, this is um, uh, but I've already covered um, the substance of this slide, which is this point about the importance of the permitting council and the discretion uh, that the council has uh, to add projects beyond those defined as covered projects. So now the final slide. What comes next? So first, what happens in Congress? Well, that's anybody's guess. Um, I do want to point to a couple of facts that may shape what happens in Congress. So first, the infrastructure bill that passed the House of Representatives, and that was earlier in the summer, um, it did not include changes to FAST 41. It would have allowed FAST 41 to sunset in December 22. But as I mentioned, the Senate bill um, did include these provisions. And because it was the result of bipartisan negotiations, that created uh, momentum, not just for passage of an infrastructure bill, but it also created significant pressure uh, not to make changes to the bill on the House side. And so that's the dynamic that we've seen play out. And it was just last week that Speaker Pelosi, um, she, she decided to bring the bill to the floor as it passed the Senate, um, but was not um, able to kind of get that over um, the finish line. And so those, those proceedings have been postponed and now everything is caught up in not only uh, the reconciliation bill, which contains um, a lot of um, high profile priorities, democratic priorities, but it's also caught up in the question um, of the debt ceiling. Um, but I'd like to take uh, a last um, minute or two um, just to talk about what happens next on the ground. So if I had to put money on it, I would say that um, the infrastructure, an infrastructure bill passes and it does contain these permitting um, provisions in it. Um, so how can agencies, industry and the public use these provisions to promote low carbon energy and Wyoming's economic future? 
Um, one thing that is gaining a fair amount of steam and is a piece of what's being considered in reconciliation is providing funding to the Council on Environmental Quality to give to agencies to engage the public affected by proposed projects and to complete environmental reviews. Such funding more than anything can help accelerate infrastructure projects because these mandates and, and timetables, um, they're, they're not gonna do a whole lot unless the agencies really have not just um, the people, uh, but also the money to get the reviews done. And so what we heard from Deputy Director Culver earlier about trying to, um, uh, to uh, reconvene DLM, uh, staff it out in an effective way is critically important. Another, the second and final point I'll make um, is the importance of investing in outreach at the front end. No doubt, it takes work building relationships in affected communities. It takes work to get these stakeholders to the table early to identify the issues. But by identifying the issues that really matter and focusing the time and resources there, that's the way um, that we uh, can diffuse controversy. So I'll end there. Uh, we put a lot on the table, but hopefully we've got some time now to get some uh, questions. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Thanks so much, Sharon. And with that, I would invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras back on so that we can sort of have a panel discussion. And I'm going to start out with a couple questions from me, and then we'll we'll go to audience questions. But the first thing I want to talk about is we've talked about Wyoming's goals. We've talked about some of the steps they've taken with HB 200 to move these things forward. And so for anyone on the panel, what is the greatest impediment to Wyoming reaching a low carbon or its net zero goals specifically? I'll let anyone who wants to start, what, what do we think the largest obstacle we have out there to face is? Well, I'll start with a quick point, um, which is I think coming to a table together and having real meaningful conversations. And, and that's hard, but instead of um, being pushed to the corners of the ring um, and um, posturing, um, we need to find ways to have the conversations um, that can bring us to the solutions. I will uh, I would just chime in there that it's, it's always that age old question of capital. Uh, Wyoming is not Texas or California and we don't have the deep pockets that we can cut billion dollar checks to get a Tesla gigafactory built now locally, right? So that is a big challenge that is kind of unique to Wyoming with the transformation of an energy economy, the scale it has, the capital is always going to be a challenge there. So that's where partnerships uh, publicly, privately with the DOE, uh, as we have the example with Terra Power and Pacific Core and the DOE project there, that is uh, going to be tremendously useful for getting over that barrier. And I would add, um, you know, speaking as I am as a recovering politician, maybe not fully recovered, uh, that changing the conversation um, the, is helping Wyoming. It's been an impediment. I think a lot of the national conversation has been dirty fossil fuels, fossil fuels bad, renewables clean and pure. Uh, and the conversation has changed um, in the meetings that I attend to focus more on decarbonization. Um, and I certainly always take the opportunity to dismiss the dirty fossil fuels myth um, because that basically insults everybody in the entire state of Wyoming. Uh, and then it, it just, it doesn't foster dialogue. <clears throat> Yeah, I would just add, and it's not quite a challenge in the same way the other panelists have responded, but, you know, the pace of technological change of economics of energy are changing so fast, that it's hard to guess where the markets are going to be a decade and two down the road. So trying to be kind of thinking about what the future markets look like when you're about to invest in technologies that 
you know, may require, a, a, you know, a 30 year amortization period is a big, huge challenge, right? Um, and I think that's particularly a challenge in a state like Wyoming which has been very reliant on coal and oil and gas, which require very high capital expenditures. And so trying to think about how um, energy is still economic in Wyoming in the future, as Glenn said, I mean, Wyoming has been a huge energy exporter. It has lots of assets where it still could be, but trying to anticipate where things are going economically and in terms of energy demand, is gonna be challenging. Thanks. The next question I have is going to be a series of questions related to future legislation and regulation. And the first one is, do we need national legislation on low carbon, net zero? Do we need national guideposts so that the states aren't trying to work independently or possibly even at cross purposes? Uh, do we need a federal model to guide us through uh, these future goals? Take a take a first swing as well. I think I'm not sure if we the word need is quite accurate. It's certainly helpful. Uh, just thinking about certain aspects of sequestration, right? With um, the long term stewardship of injected CO2, for example, uh, how to deal with um, or how to treat federal pore space in the subsurface. Those things are uh, not clear. Um, but on the other hand, some things like 45Q are driving a lot of uh, national dry, uh, build out of some of these initiatives. So I guess my answer is certainly helps, but I don't know if it's needed. Uh, maybe that's a bit hard, strong word. Um, I think I'll jump in here. I mean, whether, whether we have federal uh, standards or not, that the, the the energy transformation, the changes that are happening because they're being dictated by the market. And then also by, um, you know, individual states acting. But as uh, James mentioned, he works for a company that is answerable to six different jurisdictions. Um, and I think that is a, a complicating factor for any industry. Uh, second, I'd say that the financial markets are assessing a risk on carbon and there's not really a consistent across the board uh, assessment of those so-called ESG factors. And I think the absence of any federal energy policy for years uh, exacerbates that problem. And then finally, a frustration I have in this space um, is we have these targets by 2030 and 2050 but very few talk about how we're going to get there. What's the path forward? And I don't know if we can do that efficiently. I mean, that's what utility regulation is about, is being efficient and not wasting resources. I don't know how we do that efficiently in the absence of some coherent policy. I, I might chime in as well, and I appreciate the comments of the other panelists. Um, from you know the industry's perspective and from a utility, what we're looking for is regulatory certainty. And as Commissioner Throne mentioned, we've got these six you know service states that we're accountable to, but then you also have rules um, and policy that comes from the fed, federal government that obviously can change. And we did see a significant change in the most recent change of administration in terms of how you know energy policy is approached. And so. Uh, for a regulated utility, what we're what we're wanting is is certainty. So, to the degree that those federal policies help with that certainty, help so that we're not uh, being whipped back and forth, uh, then it's certainly appreciated. And obviously, Glenn's comment about 45Q, you know, I, I agree with that. There are there are some of those you know tax credit uh, policy pieces that really are critical as you try to address the question of uh, technologies that still have not been proven you know, wide scale at a commercial level. So, um, I mean, it's a great big, it depends, but uh, certainty is what uh, what we're after. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, we really haven't had a national energy policy in decades. 
Um, it's not really in our DNA to do things that way. We have a very, you know, state driven energy system in this country. I think the feds can play a, a role that helps to facilitate more coordination. Transmission, for example, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission right now is has announced a, a, an advanced notice of public rulemaking around transmission planning. That's clearly one place where the federal government could help to facilitate planning so that we don't have a couple of states agree to a new transmission line and then the third state says no and then nothing happens. Um, so, you know, how do you kind of bridge those gaps so that the energy market um, in this country uh, becomes more interconnected. Right now, it's very balkanized in many respects, especially with, with in terms of electricity. So the more we can do to interconnect it, um, the better we're going to be in terms of flexibility, reliability, cost, and also reducing environmental impacts. And the federal government probably needs to play some role in that. Thanks, everyone. Speaking of the federal government, the Biden administration recently announced that it's going to revise the NEPA regulations, which were, of course, revised just in the previous Trump administration. How should those rules be revised to facilitate uh, low carbon development rather than, from the perspective of some, NEPA slowing down those projects or getting in their way? I don't want to cut anybody off, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll give one viewpoint on that. Um, I think it is important um, to bring clarity and certainty back um, to uh, the role that NEPA plays and that the environmental reviews play. So one key proposal um, and what was just put out in the Federal Register, I think it was Wednesday, um, is um, they have um, return the definition of effects to back to include indirect as cum and cumulative. And so I think that is critical um, in terms of getting the information on the table that we need to make decisions that are smart, not just today, but also for tomorrow um, and take into account and provide a mechanism that flows into decision-making um, about um, the carbon emissions um, that, that Glenn and, and really all of the panelists have touched on in terms of where um, the market is driving things. Um, I'll just flag because I have the information here um, at my fingertips is so when that federal register notice came out, it did start a 45 day comment period, which will end on November 22nd. And there are two um, online uh, public hearings, which um, are going to be on October 19th and the 21st, so coming up. Anyone else wanna to touch NEPA? All right, then turning to the you local- You can answer uh, your own NEPA question. Yeah, probably <laughs> <have a few. laughs> Listen, I, yeah, I, I do have probably views, but that's the nice thing about being the moderator, right? Um, I do wanna to turn to Wyoming and have a little bit more uh, specific question is, does Wyoming anticipate or should it anticipate additional le legislation in 22 or thereafter that would entice or encourage green, uh, clean companies geothermal, whatever it may be, to come to Wyoming to locate so that we can increase our portfolio beyond what is admittedly uh, fairly uh, dependent on uh, carbon intense resources. So anyone who wants to tackle new legislation in Wyoming. Guess that'll be me. Um, so there are, uh, the only bills that I'm aware of are um, bills that address some of the, the challenges that exist or, or perceived to exist with respect to build out of some of the carbon management um, approaches or techno technologies and techniques. So there are certain bills uh, in being drafted to um, address the stewardship issue of sequestered CO2. There's another one that's being drafted to 
uh, establish a regulatory framework for accreditation of capture and sequestration, <clears throat> and potentially even tokenization and, and deployment on a blockchain. So uh, as far as I'm aware, there's, it's mostly focused on those sort of barriers to entry with respect to the carbon management world. Um, with respect to the, the, geo, um, the, the other resources, I'm not aware of anything. It, it, there is work ongoing though, uh, certainly within our agency, for example, is stopped short of requiring a bill, but it's uh, things like permitting guides, um, white papers trying to understand better the geothermal opportunity in Wyoming, not necessarily the resource, the opportunity, two different things, right? So there's, or, there's other work ongoing, uh, but I don't foresee any um, or know of any bills that are being developed that would promote uh, renewable build out or assist um, as far as I'm aware. Mary, anything you want to add about what legislation could or shouldn't look like? You spent a long time in the House. Uh, oh, I don't get to talk about what things should like should look like anymore, <laughs> except in private. Uh, but uh, I'm not really aware of anything. You know, it is a it's a budget session. Um, I think there could be uh, some tweaks to industrial siding, um, but that may not be. Uh, to improving the situation or to speeding it up. Uh, also, uh, there are um, there's some discussion that the the bill passed to incentivize uh, advanced nuclear um, needs tweak to apply to the Terra Power situation. Uh, those are some of the topics that are going to be in front of the the Minerals Committee uh, at its next meeting. Uh, but we haven't actually heard a lot about. Uh, legislation. Okay. Which makes us happy. <laughs> sure, understandable. Well, with that, actually, we're going to conclude our panel. Um, we really appreciate everyone's participation today. It's been uh, very informative, and we're going to turn things back over to Temple for some final remarks. Great. Thank you to this final panel, and thank you to Rob. That was a really great discussion as well. Um, thank you all for hanging in with us today. Um, if you made it through the whole day, we have five CLE credits approved in Wyoming and in Colorado and also through the AAPL. If you didn't make all the panels and you want a few more credit hours of CLE, we recorded today's session and we're going to post it on the SER website sometime Monday and we'll send a link to all the conference panelists as soon as that gets posted so you are aware that it's that it's there. But uh, many thanks for your participation and hanging with us today in this online format. Um, we hope to be back in person next year, but really appreciate you joining us this year in this in this format. And, and thanks to the steering committee again, and thanks to all of our panelists and speakers today. And we hope to see you again next year. Thank you. <laughs>